Good morning. I hope you're having an enjoyable day so far. Today I'm going to talk about Excalibur, which is the movie having to do with King Arthur. And this story, some say is mythological and some say is historical. So there's no agreement on whether it is or is not. <laughs> so what's also interesting is from a tarot perspective that what we have is the king, the queen, the knight, the magician, and the fool. Although I'm not gonna get into that today, it's just an interesting correlation and the relevance and importance of the sword which is obviously a part of the tarot as well. So I find that really interesting that all of these components are in it. And if you had a really deep understanding of this tarot system, it would be interesting to see what the parallels are to the actual cards here. The, and the tarot you can see sometimes is relevant even in cultural events and in um, dreams as well. So. It's an interesting um, way to perceive what's happening in the culture and in ourselves. But here we're gonna just focus on the symbolism today and the story in terms of transforming consciousness. So Excalibur begins with conflict and war and Uther wants Egraine, who is married to someone else, and so he goes to Merlin and he asks Merlin to weave a spell in order to sleep with Egraine. So Merlin says, you know, I'll do it, but it's gonna cost you. And Uther doesn't care, he's just obsessed with her, he has to be with her. And so Merlin weaves his magic, does his magic and he weaves a mist. And as Uther rides through the mist, he's transformed and be, ends up wearing his own armor, tr tr is transformed into the armor of her husband. So her experience is that her husband comes to her to sleep with her, and so they have sex. And what happens is then shortly later, Uther leaves, and a little bit later, um, they bring her husband in dead. He died on the battlefield. So she knows like, oh, something was up here because that couldn't have been my husband. It couldn't have been him because he was on the battlefield and died. So what you have is this, this setup of the story and this kind of opening scene. And the only other person that's there for this um, union, of the two is her daughter who is by her husband and that is Morgana and Morgana plays a role so she's actually Arthur's half sister and so when um, the baby is born it's Arthur and Merlin comes and is like okay now you got to pay up <laughs> that's where I take the baby and Egraine is just over the top about it, right? Because she's, she's losing her child. And Uther knows he has no choice but to give it up. So they give the child to Merlin. Merlin takes the child to a couple that is a very ordinary couple, a very normal, humble uh, beginning is what happens for Arthur. So we see this kind of a beginning in stories repeatedly. We see it in The Wizard of Oz, right? Dorothy is uh, an, a, an orphan. She's adopted by Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. And that type of beginning for a hero or heroine of a story can happen, right? We see in Cinderella where her mother dies, we see in Rapunzel where the baby is taken from the parents, just like here with Arthur. And so that gives them a different beginning than they would have had, a, a different conditioning than they would have had had he grown up with his own father and his, his own mother 
And that may not have been possible considering the origins of him and the influence he would have received from that particular setup, the, the, this deception, his father's influence, now all that goes away because he has no idea who he really is. This is another thing that we see that the fairy tales are doing is they are, and this isn't necessarily considered a fairy tale, but what they're trying to do is, is that conditioning of who I think I am is not the truth of who I am. So we really see that very clearly in this story where initially he is appearing as this just humble, he plays the role of squire to his older brother, but it's not his real brother because it's the fake brother, but he doesn't know that. And so that's the next part of the story where there is a joust going on. He's the squire, he's the one that's supposed to take care of all the things that his brother's going to need when his brother um, goes into joust and, and um and do what knights do, do or, or I guess he, I don't think he's a knight at this point, his brother. But anyway, so Arthur's in charge of helping him to be ready and have the things that he needs available. And so when it's his brother's turn to go in and, and have his, his combat or, you know, just, it, I don't think, it's not to the death at this point, it's just um, like an event. And so at this point he needs the sword and Arthur's supposed to have it, but Arthur doesn't have it. And so this is really interesting the way they portray this because this is like that fateful intervention you hear me talk about. And in this faithful, fateful moment, what you have is they, they ask like, okay, Arthur, like, where's your brother's sword? And so he goes back to the tent to get the sword. The, he comes in the front door of the tent and if someone's running out, a young boy's running out of the back of the tent with the sword. So Arthur takes after him and he goes, the young boy goes into the forest and Arthur is following him. And as he's following him, he comes across a stone that has a sword in it. And so he figures, well, my brother can just use this one. And so he reaches in and he grabs it and he pulls it out and he takes it to them and his father's like, where did you, it's not his real father, right? It's his kind of adoptive father. And he says, where did you get this? Because they can see it's not the sword. It's not his brother's sword. And he's like, oh, I pulled it from the stone. And they, the, everybody follows him back into the woods and, and he says, do it again. So he plunges the sword into the stone and then they said, pull it out again. And he easily does. And so this upsets some of the people and they're like, put it back and then and then they want to try, but no one else can do it. So when he does pull it out, they recognize he is the king. The, so the sword was in the stone until the rightful king came along. And so in this case, he became the right age. It became the right moment. And they talk about this as being Kairos, like everything lines up and that this is the moment when he needs to transition from the family that he thought was his own. And this is the moment that he finds out what his true identity is. And his, his adoptive father says, yes, in fact, Merlin brought you to us when you were a, an infant. And this is not, and we are not actually your family. And that's when Merlin appears and he's like, okay, now it's time for you to come with me. This is like the next phase of the transformation. So here we're really seeing the ev evolution of the masculine. So this can be seen as um, the masculine energy in a woman. This can be just a man himself can see this story as showing how to transform that male consciousness and how that masculine energy is in service or not in service to the feminine. So the fact that we start out with a war indicates an imbalance, right? There's this deception to the feminine. There, 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 there not. There isn't an honesty here in the origins of um, Arthur. So this kind of fateful intervention unfolds and is really the perfect unfolding of events 
These are the kind of things that like everything just lines up in a particular way to make something happen. And that's when you know like it's basically a fateful intervention because so many things lined up perfectly in order for it to occur that he would come across the sword and pull it from the stone. So Merlin takes Arthur into the forest and Arthur really has to confront his fear. That needs to be cleared if he's going to step into his role as a leader. And he does. He has to has to face them. And he then is in a battle. So the knights pledge begin to pledge themselves to him. But they're still kind of, you know, uncertain because he does he's young and he, there's no history he was a squire moments before he pulled the sword from the stone so you know these these knights have proven themselves that's how they became knights so in battle they they have this one battle and he fights valiantly and one of the the knights is struggling to like acknowledge that he's going to be um subservient to and serve this young man. And so Arthur kneels in front of him and hands him the sword and says, you unite me. And in that moment, ooh, excuse me, in that moment, the knight realizes I, at this moment, could kill him. He is completely undefended. He's given me his sword. And he realizes the level of strength the level of fearlessness that that moment required for him to step in was the moment where they got it. They got, oh, this is the king. And he did knight him. And then he swore that he would serve him. So it's really just a story with just so much powerful imagery in it. And um, in terms of this transformation of consciousness, in terms of the role that fear and clearing fear needs to happen in order to step into more power. We've been talking about this in various fairy tales because what happens is power is projected. And so that's often where the fear comes in. And when we take back those projections, we're clearing that fear and understanding that we don't need to be afraid of what's outside of us when we clear that fear inside of us. Isn't that interesting how they did that? So great story, by the way, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I know it's a little bit old, but I think I've seen quite a few of, of the movies of Arthur and, and the story. And really this one is the best, I think. So he clears his fears and he really is building his knights and wants to um, start really bringing people together. And the next part of the story is he's out riding and comes upon Lancelot and Lancelot won't back down. <laughs> and Arthur says he's not going to back down. So that means they have to get their swords out and start dueling and or start a sword fight. I don't know what it's called. And um, and it's a real challenge. They're really they're really very well matched, but Arthur breaks Excalibur because he isn't in integrity. He is has his ego has gotten the best of him. And in that moment of egoic like I wanna win, um, he breaks the sword and he realizes immediately why the sword has broken is because he was out of integrity, out of alignment, and not in that space of clarity to a bigger purpose. And so it was, it was personal in that moment. It wasn't about the kingdom. It wasn't about anything. It was two egos basically going at it. And so he ends up throwing Excalibur, what's left of it, into the lake that's there. And when he has this realization, 
the uh, hand comes shooting up out of the water with the mended Excalibur, which he grabs very quickly. So because he realized that, it was, it was mended and he received it back. And in that moment, Lancelot says, yeah, I'll be a knight for you. And Arthur decides to create the round table. So that's really cool because the round table then is wholeness. And it represents that um, coming together of the different aspects in order to create wholeness for the kingdom, right? This would be like a foundation for the kingdom itself is that wholeness. So Merlin comes along and says, Arthur, you need to get married. And so he had met Guinevere and he really liked her smitten by her and said that's who he wanted to be his wife and she agrees or her father agrees and she is coming to the she's in the litter and they're coming to um, Camelot they're riding to Camelot and um, Lancelot is one of the knights that is escorting her and she says all of the young women in her litter are all giddy over how attractive Lancelot is and she says you know can any of them win your heart and he says no because he's sworn to her as the queen and that's all and so that's like the first moment where there's this kind of click for her between in this moment of connection between them that goes deeper than the superficial like she's like yeah i'm first where he's concerned there is no other but me and so that's an important point in beginning to really um, flesh out this relationship between the two of them so the connection between them is growing and then there you get this sense like of of Camelot kind of being in this this um, ideal situation this Eden, Edenic kind of a, a moment where everything is good it's all coming together it's all working together there's harmony in the kingdom and they're drinking and they're all sitting around the round table and interestingly the one who speaks up is with Morgana, which is his half, which I, as I said, was Arthur's half sister. And so you have this sense that she may have been up to something here that caused him to speak out. And he said what basically what everybody was thinking, which was that there was something going on between Guinevere and Lancelot. And so because he came right out loud in front of everybody and said, I think something's happening here, that then something had to happen in order to resolve that and what that means is someone had to duel him someone had to fight him and then the winner essentially would be the one who survived and that would mean that was the truth and so Guinevere turns to her husband Arthur who's sitting right beside her and he says I can't I can't do it and she's like what do you mean you can't do it and he says I can't champion you because I'm the king and so if he dies then that's the end of the kingdom I mean that's the end of Camelot so he can't do it and she's like well you're king before you're the husband and he essentially says yes in fact he is and so there's this moment again this is another one of those kind of moments where like time stops and she's kind of taking this in just interestingly right like when Lancelot made his declaration, here's Arthur making his declaration saying, you can't be first, you can only be second. And so Parsifal says that he will step in and fight and event when the, when the challenge, the day of the challenge, at the last minute, Lancelot comes riding in to do it. So he does it, but he gets wounded and you get the idea that he's kind of mortally wounded here. 
And so Arthur goes to Merlin and he says, Merlin, you know, you have magic, save him. And Merlin says, it's going to be at a price, right? Just like what happened with Arthur's father, this is, there's going to, it's going to have to come with a price. And Arthur's like, I don't care. Like he's his best friend is his number one knight, like save him. And so Merlin takes Gwen and her love that has, is, has evolved for Lancelot and uses that to heal him. At this point, nothing has happened between Gwen. You get the feeling like it's, it was building, but nothing had happened. And then after that, they end up sleeping together in the forest. And Arthur finds them while they're asleep and he takes his sword and he plunges it into the ground between the two of them as they sleep. And so because Merlin is connected to the land in a magical way, it actually harms Merlin. When in the morning, when Guinevere and Lancelot wake up and they see the sword, they're devastated. Not only did he find out and does he now know, which now they know he knows because his sword, it's his sword that's there. Not only that, but they know that if the king doesn't have a sword, then the kingdom doesn't have a king. And so this goes way beyond just like he's upset. It goes to the heart of what's happening here. You might think of this moment as the disruptive moment for Camelot, but it really isn't because the disruptive moment comes when Arthur chooses the kingdom over his wife, which is really head over heart. He doesn't, he doesn't, or, or you could say over soul. So the heart and soul are what he's setting aside in order to be the ruler, which Lancelot didn't do. Lancelot is this gallant and knight with just incredible integrity, but he can't set, he, he, he can't not set that aside when it comes to the heart. And Arthur was the opposite. So really it's as though there are these two masculine energies in the psyche and those two energies are playing out is it the the ruler the the one who is only interested in ruling and the heart takes second place or is it that the heart comes before the integrity and of the culture of the rules of the culture so what we're seeing is that really that the heart challenges those things right so the, everything falls apart at that point. Lancelot goes mad because he realizes that what he, he spent his whole life for, which is this integrity of chivalry, of being in, in, in honoring the king, which is his best friend, and honoring the queen, which he really hasn't done here either. And so he recognizes that and he goes mad and he just wanders off, right? He's gone. Guinevere ends up in a nunnery. So there's no coming together of these two. There's no, and, and what's happening for Arthur is he's, he's, he's basically wasting away. So this is like what's happening. And so the knights have to find a solution to this by going on the quest for the grail. So the grail is what they're searching for all of the knights are out searching and what happens is they they're dying um, Morgana uh, weaves her uses the magic that she's learned from Merlin and she weaves a spell and Arthur thinks he's sleeping with Guinevere but really it's his sister Morgana his half-sister and so she gives birth to Mordred, 
which is her son and Arthur's son. And she basically conditions him to take Arthur's place. But he is like the big ego, the ego that's like inflated. She has basically made like put spells on him to make him immune and, and all this other stuff. And she's just inflated him to a crazy degree. So he's, he's brutal. He's, he's not a nice guy. And so this is what has been created again through another deception, right? That you see with these two, she weaves a well, a web around Arthur in order to have sex with him. So you see, this is a pattern that you see with her parents, then with um, the deception of Arthur with Guinevere and Lancelot, and then, and then with his sister. And so you see this pattern over and over again of this lack of honesty, this lack of commitment, this lack of integrity. So this is part of what happens with the inner masculine, or you could say an, uh, a person who is masculine, male, um, that they're trying to transform this consciousness. And so it's the historic element comes in, the patriarchal element, and these other aspects of the masculine energetically, and they're working together to be transformed. So we might say, like, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, that's good, but it really isn't because it's all working together to create more consciousness. And we kind of have to have to really look at it that way. So Arthur is, is deteriorating. All of the knights are questing, looking for the grail. Morgana is putting a spell on some of the knights. So some of the knights come basically to her side because they, they're out of their mind. She's bewitched them and they've gone there. Others are dying. So this is the first time we see Parsifal and he's hanging on a tree and he's hanging like by the neck and he's between life and death in this moment. And he's trying to hold on, trying to stay alive. And there is another knight who has a spur on his armor, on the, on the foot, whatever they call the boot. And it's working at the rope that is he's being hung by. So at the last minute, it, it sets him down. But when he's in that in-between place, he enters the Grail Castle. And when it asks him the questions, he doesn't have an answer and he comes out and he, he recovers full consciousness at that point. And so continues the quest for the grail. More and more of the knights are dying. And the next point, he ends up falling into a river and he's got all his armor on. So he's not floating, he's sinking. And so the scene is him underwater as he's shedding the armor. And this is like the Tin Man here, right? The Tin Man with the armor and we have the heart is the important element. And he's shedding this armor so he's dying underwater and he enters into the Grail Castle once again. The voice comes and it asks him the important questions. And he, first question, whom does the grail serve? And Parsifal says, you, my lord and king, Arthur. And so this moment, right? So you would think on a superficial level, like, okay, these are different, different people. But here we really get this sense of how would Parsifal be in, Arthur's psyche, right? The only way would be they're all aspects of one. So here's this other aspect of the masculine that as I was saying before, he's like the fool that kind of is willing to go into the unknown and willing to give his all and just just is more innocent and open. And so he ha finally has the answer. My king, Arthur, my lord and king, Arthur. 
And then the voice comes back again and says, what was the second question? Whom does the grail serve? Let me see if I wrote it down. Um, who am I? Whom does the grail serve? Oh. Huh. He answers the question, whom does the grail serve? And he says, you, my lord. Oh, okay. He says, whom does the grail serve? And he says, you, my lord. And he says, who am I? And he says, my lord and king, Arthur. So that's the point where you have, it's an inner journey. This grail castle, because he's in between life and death, this grail castle is not out in the world. That's where the knights were going. They were looking for it in the world. What would fix this? And it isn't in the world. It was inside Arthur's psyche. So you, my lord, king and king Arthur, have you found the secret I have forgotten? And he says, the king and the land are one. The inside and the outside are one. They're the same. And so here he is between, we think of death as between the above and the below. And he's saying the inside and the outside are the same. So what needs to happen to restore life to the outside is the inside. We talked about the Wizard of Oz last week, and right, we talked about a very similar thing there. So Parsifal then gets the grail, the cup, and he goes, right, the cup is the feminine, and he goes back to Arthur. And Arthur is like barely alive is what he looks like. And Parsifal takes the cups and holds it to his lip, the cup take, holds it to his lips and says, here, drink from the cup. And he says, drink from the, ch drink from the chalice and you and the land will be reborn. And, and Arthur drinks from the chalice and he says, Parsifal, I didn't know how empty was my soul until it was filled. Isn't that lovely? Oh. <laughs> Makes all my hair stand up on end every time I say it. It's really incredible. So Arthur is revived by the feminine. And so he comes, one of the knights come in and they're like, Arthur, like you're standing, you're, you're, you know, you're restored. And Arthur says, gather the knights because they have to go into battle against Mordred because Arthur is going to die and he can't leave Mordred and Mordred's going to come after him anyway and kill him and take over the throne. So they have to battle him and, and get that resolved. So they go ahead and Lancelot is notified and Lancelot comes back and so they fight Mordred and they kill Mordred and Arthur is fatally wounded. Lancelot dies. And as Arthur lays on the battlefield, he, um, he says to Parsifal, he says, Parsifal, take Excalibur and go throw it in the water. And so Parsifal rides off and he's about to throw it in the water and he looks at it and he's like, I can't do that. <laughs> so he hides it. He goes back to Arthur. Arthur says, did you throw it in the water? He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> Arthur says, well, what'd you see? He goes, just a little splash. <laughs> Arthur goes, go back and do it again. <laughs> I know you didn't do it. So Parsifal goes back and he gets the sword from where he hid it and he throws it and it tumbles end over end and then just as it comes down towards the water the lady of the lake her hand reaches up and she grabs through the sword and she pulls it down into the water so the sword is back in her hands until a king worthy of the sword of wielding the sword with integrity be, is born so we have no idea how long that's going to be centuries hundreds of years we don't know 
but Gwen had the Guinevere had the sword and that's how he got it back she she had kept it when remember he plunged it into the earth and she grabbed it and um, she took it with her to the nunnery so when he met her to get that back which I forgot this part but when he met her to get that back he said now you know when I'm done when I meet you in heaven you know then I can be husband first so you get the understanding that he got it he got it that king was one thing but that being full in the soul love that is what fills us that that was really what mattered in the end and he recognized that at that point and so you get this sense of it all kind of coming together and the understanding came the transformation came and came about only because of the feminine that that was the key it was the key with the cup it was the key with his to fill his soul and it was the key with Guinevere as well so <laughs> I love that story so much I hope you enjoyed it it's very uh, interesting in terms of how we transform that masculine consciousness it has to be in service to the feminine it has to understand the value of the feminine so when we have a situation in our own lives where we aren't as women or men honoring the feminine then this is kind of what's happening in our consciousness in the psyche it's it's there's this kind of these different aspects of the masculine that are at play and it's which one is in the driver's seat which one is um, the partner of the feminine and so what we're looking for is saying that maybe all of these aspects are aspects of the masculine remember when we looked at the handless maiden right and especially that moment where they were in the in the garden at the beginning of the story there's there's the king and then there was the the minister the priest and then there was the gardener so we had this kind of amalgamation of masculines and then at the beginning we had the father and the devil so we have these different parts coming together and to representing the wholeness so the king kind of represents the central figure and then these other pieces represent aspects so it was really here the transformation of that king consciousness and so we kind of have a primary masculine and it's a transformation of that masculine consciousness which we see in the fairy tales a lot especially like all of them Cinderella and so we go from the father consciousness to the prince consciousness and what's happening or the king and handless maiden and so what's happening in that process of the transforming the masculine consciousness so we can have this again in a masculine and a guy or we can have this in um, a woman in the feminine and her masculine transforming so okay <laughs> hope you enjoyed it hope you have a lovely rest of your Saturday and thank you for listening thank you for joining me I might not be back next weekend I'm not sure yet I have a may have a glitch in my schedule so I'll try to put up a video maybe if I if I can't go live in order to do it next week but I might not get to it I'm not sure how the week's gonna play out so hopefully I'll see you take care <laughs>